this week has been um, verging on the incredible for me. Uh, just looking at what I wanted to try to share next. Um, I, I'm, I'm mindful of some of the nice teasing about you know being as detailed as Craig Barnes. And it, in fact, one of the commentaries that I have in my computer is Barnes Dictionary of the Bible. Uh, so that sort of reminds me every once in a while. Um, in fact, when we were sitting up there at seven o'clock and 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 uh, we were getting ready to lead Heather in worship. <laughs> I was thinking maybe I had gotten too wonky last week, which I may well have, and I, I imagine that tonight might be a little bit more of the same, but, but then we'll, we'll be on to stuff that's not quite as wonky. Um, but as, as much for myself as, as anything else, I wanted to put back up John's statement of purpose. Uh, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The, the discussion that we're about to jump into is um, a, a double-edged sword because on the positive side, the talking about the the, the word of God or the logos um, is uh, theologically at the at the uh, core of Pentecostal theology and and uh, charismatic theology. Uh, if if you were fortunate enough to experience the charismatic renewal of the late 60s and 70s, John was the was the gospel to focus on. Um, but John is also the gospel that was focused on by the Gnostics. Uh, if, you've, if you've heard anything about the heresies of the, of the early church, the, the Gnostic, uh, the Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, were a, a, a splinter group of Christians who had a they had a slightly different perspective on Jesus, which was declared heretical for good reason, uh, and a lot of it had to do with some exaggeration of the concepts that I, I, I want to share with you tonight. Which I have to tell you, they they caused me want to go running around and dancing and yelling and screaming because I, I get so excited about it. Um, but uh, it, it all revolves around this this Greek logos and some some very tightly intertwined concepts to that, um, and and we'll have to dig into that a little bit deeply tonight because without that, the rest of John's gospel is yeah 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 you know what is it blah 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 how does that go anyway um, I I. Stole a bunch of things from different commentaries and even found some new ones I hadn't read before that set me off on another tizzy. Um, that that word that the word word in Greek logos um, is a is a an ancient Hebrew concept. It's it comes out of the Old Testament, but at the same time that there's a very strong Hebrew concept attached to this idea of logos, uh, there's also a Greek philosophical concept that revolves around the same word, um, uh, logos. And when, when you read, in the beginning was the word, if you're inclined towards thinking in a Hebrew sense, you start remembering the, the spirit of God that hovered on the water in creation in the Genesis story. Um, if you have any Greek orientation, you, you start thinking about the philosophical concept and there's a, 
there's a whole cosmology, a, a theory of what heaven looks like that's attached to the, the Greek concept of the logos. Uh, we get little hints of that when uh, Paul writes about, um, I, I know a man who ascended to the third heaven, the, the Greek concept of, of cosmology that logos comes out of actually has, I think it's seven le levels of heaven. Um, and and I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I only just barely dipped my toes into that when I wrote my, my famous paper in, in, in high school. And I don't remember much of it at all. Just that it was a, an important Greek concept in the, the couple of centuries just before Jesus arrived. And the Greeks listening to John when they heard him say Logos, would have remembered that Greek belief system. Um, and uh, the, the Hebrew, the Jews, would have heard echoes of the Old Testament concept. Um, and, and, and so it's just an incredibly rich uh, uh, concept. Um, and I finally found the translation where I got this, and God said, light be. Um, I've heard the translation, but I'd never heard of, heard of the translation labeled Rotherham, um, where I was telling you that another way to translate the, the third verse of, of Genesis is just, God said, light be. Um, so I wanted to, to throw that up. Um, and at some point in the next several weeks, I, I want to go back to the comment I made last week that Pauline asked me a question about, which said something about the Synoptic Gospels only covering one year of Jesus' ministry. After I copied that message in here and read it, it didn't sound quite right. So I want to get back to that at some point to try to figure out why they said that when it doesn't seem to be very true. Um, I'll come back to that. Uh, an important piece of this first verse of John is God created by means of his word. Um, there are uh, two aspects of the concept of words. When you, when you think about words, First off, there are words in your head that you think about, and then there are words that you express. And there's a there's a fundamental difference because a thought expressed or a thought not expressed, you know, doesn't help the community at all. Uh, and if you can imagine for a moment, as as best our, our feeble minds can. You could imagine the mind of God thinking all of these thoughts and then expressing those thoughts, putting them out as verbiage, as, as speech. That's two different aspect, uh, aspects of word. Uh, and, and so in, the, in here, when we're talking about in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God, what we think is a huge part of who we are and what we are. And that's part of what's being at least hinted at in, the, in this phrase. Um, there's, a, there's another aspect of this that comes up in the Old Testament. Um, and if, if I can convey what is running around in my brain, then the next time you read some of these stories in the Old Testament, you'll want to giggle because the, the, the various writers in the Old Testament, when they're talking about this idea of the God who spoke, who created through his word, and he compares it to dumb idols. Now, for all of my life, when I would read the Old Testament and it would say things about, you know, don't worship dumb idols, it was like, that's a dumb idol. That's a stupid idol. That's an idiotic idol. The word dumb means 
can't talk. So part of part of the idiocy, never mind the disobedience, but part of the idiocy associated with worshiping an idol made out of wood that can't speak and therefore is a dumb idol. Um, and by implication is also deaf, so it can't listen to your prayers. And it can't, since it can't say anything, it can't cause anything or create anything. If you're worshiping a dumb idol, what's the point? It can't hear your prayers. It can't hear your praises. It can't respond to your requests by causing anything because it can't speak. And it's the act of speaking that causes things to be. So now when you when you when you go back and look at the Old Testament, and I didn't bring a reference, um, but um, who was it? Who was the prophet that that went to battle against the prophets of Baal and there were 50 prophets of Elijah. Um, and, and, and he's making these jokes about, well, maybe your gods are asleep and pray louder so you can wake them up so they can step up to the, to the task. Um, and, and then finally, after a ridiculous amount of time has passed, he says, well, basically, let me show you how God works. And he calls down basically asks God to speak with his tongues of fire and the fire comes down and it cleans up all the things that that uh, tell me his name again Elijah put on the altar and he cleaned up all the water that was in the trough and then he went over and he cleaned up all the stuff that you know burned up all the stuff that the other prophets had put as as offerings to, to Baal and then he cleaned up the, the prophets too I mean, it, it's a it's an awesome sight, but it's funny. And and when you start looking at that idea of the dumb idol that these idiots were worshiping, it's no longer that is a, that's a stupid thing to worship. No, it's a dumb idol. It can't speak. And since it can't speak, it can't create. And at least in our mind, if it can't create, is it really God? The answer is no. It's just a dumb idol. It's a statue. Like I said, I, uh, this this stuff wants me to jump up and dance around and run around screaming and. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I I, I stopped at the red. Uh, I, I stopped at the, the red, white, and blue thrift store on the way back from the funeral this afternoon, and they had a sale going on. So this, this shirt, which was marked for $1.95, I got for 97 and a half cents. And the, uh, <laughs> worth every penny. <laughs> I thought it would go over well in the hospital, except I can't put my chaplain's collar on um, that's right yeah that's and I and I'm still I mean I'm planning to lose another 110 pounds so I I don't want to spend a lot of money on a new shirt that fits right now that six months from now won't <laughs> This is one of the commentaries that I that I uh, stole from. A lot of this comes from the international. Uh, I got the reference at the end of the, the section. Uh, ISBE is the is the uh, the acronym. The the doctrine of the logos or the concept of the logos has exerted a, a decisive and far-reaching influence upon speculative uh, speculative thought, which is to say pagan thinking and Christian thinking. The word, and notice this is a small W, not the capital W, the, the word logos has a, a long history and the, and the idea has a lot to do with man's concept of God. Um, the, the relation of the deity to the world 
mean, that's that's the point of religious philosophy, if you will. And uh, from the from the dawn of Western speculation, the the Greek word uh, has been employed fairly universally. In its simplest form, it means speech. But it, in classical Greek, Greek, it also means both reason, that is, what we think, and, and word in the sense of speech. Um, it usually simply means word, but you've got to keep the idea of reason and word. Sometimes you hear people say, if I can't express it, I haven't fully thought it. Uh, and that's that's the idea behind this. I know for me there are lots of thoughts rumbling in my brown in my brown in my brain. They're coming too fast for them to come out of my mouth. But if I don't write them down or express them, they're not uh, they're not complete. They're not in they're not in full. They're brown. Yeah, they're not in they're not in full form. They're not fully formed. They're more like fetal tissue in the earliest stages. It's not logical, right? Very good. Nice little pun there. Logical, logo. Um, the, the translation thought is probably the best equivalent for the Greek term since it, since it brings into mind the, the, the idea of reason uh, which is the thought inwardly conceived, but on the other hand, the, the thought outwardly expressed through speech. Uh, the guy who wrote this used some $3 words that I actually changed some of them as I was putting this in. Uh, the, the two ideas, thought and speech, are indubitably blended in the term logo. Uh, and every time that word is used, whether in philosophy and or in, in Christian theology, both aspects of that are are important to, to keep in mind. So when you're thinking about in the beginning was the word, yeah, we think of this as Jesus, but it's the thought of God, but also the expressed the in, the unexpressed thought that he has conceived, but also the expressed thought that he has spoken. I only had one cup of coffee today because I didn't want to get too excited. Um, and that was like 2 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> um, and the word, um, okay, the word logos has a, has a rich tradition in Greek thought. I've sort of said that before. The philosopher Heraclitus, um, five centuries before Christ, uh, talked about it or, or used it in the concept of an ordering principle of the universe. And if you think of the universe as having been created out of the mind of God, then the word that he conceived is what caused the universe to be the way it is. The universe isn't a random thing that just happened to be. It's, it's, a, it's a system that God thought up and spoke, and there it was. Um, so, and here's the, here's the uh, same wordplay that... Uh, Brother Steve spoke a moment ago. The, the Logos is the divine logic that gives order to the universe. He thought all of this in his head. All of the intricacy, the process whereby a baby grows, uh, the, the process of green stuff in plant photosynthesis, how that goes, um, the the way a child needs to be taught and trained, uh, the whole concept of us hearing about Jesus and choosing 
to believe or not to believe. All of this was thought by God. And when he said, earth be, it was there. He spoke one word and all of this came out. All of this thought in his brain just... Uh, <laughs> it, it just happened. Uh, makes me think that, that Nike is a Christian company because they just said, do it! Um, now... Logos as the revelation of God. Uh, the, the sources of that concept, which are, they're both Old Testament and post-canonical literature means apo the Apocrypha. A lot of times we think about the Apocrypha as strange stuff that Catholics include in their Bible that we should ignore. But the, the other word for the Apocrypha books is Deutero, deuterocanonical books, which means a second canon. We, we talk about our Bible as being the canon of Scripture, the 66 books that we pay attention to. And then there's a second list of books, uh, most of which happened after Malachi and before uh, the New Testament. Uh, they have a lot of good stuff that's worth reading. Uh, more important than Chuck Swindoll and Joel Osteen. But not as important as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, and there are a lot of quotes in the next couple of pages. Where did my... There it is. Okay. Uh, the God who is made known in, in Scripture, our, our 66 books, uh, is one who actively reveals himself by speaking. And, and he is exhibited, therefore, as making his will known in and by his spoken utterances, his speech. He says something and it happens. And so we, we look at this phrase, the word of God, um, and it's the, it's the creative principle. It's the way the world came into being. But in Hosea, it's used... Uh, to speak a word of judgment. Uh, God spoke uh, judgment uh, through Hosea, and, and that was referred to as the word of God. It's also an agent of healing. Psalm 107 is an example of that. Um, we see a lot of that in the, in the New Testament as well. Um, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto thee. Take the... Thank you. It's a song. I, I, I'm looking at her because it's a song, and I can't remember all the words. But um, and and so it's not just that Peter and John were walking by and just sort of waved something at at the guy, and he stood up and walked. It's, they told him, they spoke the word of God, and he was healed. Um, okay. Well, this is the phrase that you see most often in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't quite so often say the Word. They say the Word of God. Um, and and in the in the Old Testament, it, it's expressed that way as well. Um, uh, they don't have capital letters in Hebrew, so. Uh, that's more of an English distinction. And part of the challenge in all of this is distinguishing between the word word and the word logos. So I, I've been trying in, in all of what I've captured here to make sure I capitalize W 
when the concept we want to be aware of is is that of logos or the Hebrew word which escapes me right now um, so we, we are talking about you can you can look at this phrase word of God and most of the time it's reasonable to think of that as logos which will refresh you of all the stuff that crazy guy spoke of in February and March although primarily just just now crazy guy being me <laughs> I remember some preacher sometimes saying something about logos and he went nuts about it Yes, it, it is true um, that typically in Scripture when you see the Word, like in the beginning was the Word, you want to be aware of that as being a reference to Jesus. But there's a lot more to it than just that. Uh, And that's part of that. That is part of the Gnostic heresy, that 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 Jesus was less than God. Um, and I, I really don't quite understand how they got there from the Gospel of John, because this concept of logos. Um, when you think of the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it feels like three distinct pieces. Um, and, and yeah, they're a part of the triune God, but that's a, that's a tough nut to wrap your brain around. When you start looking at the concept of logos, and there are a couple of other words that we're going to come up with, um, two in a, in a couple of slides, where we start to look at this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as, as not really being distinct. Um, God is God, and, and it's all God. I mean, there, there's one aspect of God that we recognize in, in our mortal brains as Jesus. And there's another aspect of God that we recognize in our mortal brains as the Holy Spirit. And then a, a, a sort of more distant aspect of God that we think of typically as God the Father. But it's all it's all one God. In, in, in Deuteronomy 6, the, the Hebrew says that the Lord our gods the Lord is one it's not I mean it's it's three in one um, but it's it, it really is one and so if, if you start thinking about God with his thinking and he expressed his thought it's still that's still part of God it's not something distinct or or something that you can separate I mean you can't separate your thinking from your needs without a chainsaw you know um, my my first shot at seminary they they warned us that new ministers in in churches that use the the uh, common lectionary or the revised common lectionary 
There's one Sunday of the year that everybody in the world that uses that lectionary has to preach on the Trinity. And because this concept is, is so hard to wrap your arms around, senior ministers never want to preach the term. They always want to dump it on the, the young guy. And I was sitting in seminary saying, bring it on, I want it. Um, of course, now I'm sitting here and I'm struggling with the words and, and, and I'm struggling to express the concept of my head. I don't know how well I'm doing, but at least I can give you a, a flavor of, it's more than just, you know, okay, we can carve out Jesus as, as a third of God. I heard, heard one AG preacher who I used to love to use with my, my youth ministry who said that the best way to think about God is cherry pie. And I don't mean the, the institutional cherry pie that you get out of the freezer case or the grocery store and you can slice it and the, the pieces come out distinct. You take homemade cherry pie and when you cut it, Yes, there's a line of demarcation in the crust that separates that nice big pie into three big pieces, like big pieces of pie. Can't eat them anymore, but still like them. But when you go to lift that pie out of the pie tin, it all runs out because it, it, you can't separate one third of the pie from the rest of it. It all just flows back in. Uh, that's the way God is. When you try to pull Jesus out and describe Jesus Christ as something, a, a distinct part of God, you can't because you keep going back in and people will ask questions about, well, you know, there are reference to, references to the Ruach in the Old Testament. You know, that's the Holy Spirit, but how could the Holy Spirit come before Jesus because Jesus when he was here, said, I go to heaven and I will send you a counselor. So how could the Holy Spirit be here in the Old Testament when Jesus hadn't come to send him back? And it's like, it's God. God was here on earth. He went to heaven and sent us another part of himself, another piece of cherry pie, but it never disconnected from the whole pie. I'm going to move on because, I mean, I could go on like this for, for days. Um, and I'm sure somebody would fall asleep before then. Um, you like that cherry pie? The theology of the cherry pie? Okay. Now, I, I, I didn't know how to rewrite this sentence. I got confused by this because I'm looking at a capital R and, and I'm thinking the book of the New Testament, but really it's just a capital R because it's the first word of the sentence. Um, the, the word of God is presented as the creative principle. God spoke his word and the, the world came to be. Um, agent of healing, possessor of personal qualities, it's easiest to think of God as a person in the form of Jesus. Um, and when we think about revelation in general, when, when God reveals something to us, uh, when Lillian has a special message on Sunday mornings, that's, that's, she brings to us the word of the Lord. And that's, it, it's it's we think of that as the spoken word although often if you can remember what she says you'll find it in scripture her her words of prophecy are uh, almost word for word from the bible uh, so in uh, although it's true that when god reveals things to us it is the word of the Lord, the spoken word, but there's not a big distinction between that spoken word often and the, the written word the, in the sense of the Bible. Uh, 
Um, oh, I love this word, theophanies. Everybody knows the word epiphany? Uh, epi, not in, not in the sense of epinephrine, but epi means highest. Uh, so when you think of the word epiphany, uh, people talk about, I had an epiphany, I had a revelation, I had a, a really profound thought, something was revealed to me in a, in a very profound and high way. We call that an epiphany. And in the, in the church calendar, the, the 13th day of Christmas, which is January 6th, is called the Feast of the Epiphany. It's the day that the wise men supposedly arrived at the, let me not say supposedly, the day the wise men arrived at the manger and, and met the Christ child. Um, and that's, that was their epiphany. That's when they had their highest experience, their mountaintop. So epiphany is, the, the fanny is an experience, epi is highest. So epiphany is the experience of the highest. Theophany is an experience of God. They're very similar, but the word theophany is most often used to describe stories in the Old Testament where there was a, a person who appeared in a special way and did something very special. Uh, there are probably dozens of examples. Is somebody thinking of one right now? Perfect. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's three people, but when the when the guards looked at the furnace, they saw four. That was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a theophany, which is a $2 word that basically means Jesus was there. But they don't say Jesus was there. They don't say Christ was there. Sometimes they say the angel of the Lord. Uh, uh, Jacob wrestled with the angel and his hip got out of joint and thereafter he was called Israel. Um, and that's why Jews won't eat the hip joint of, of an animal because that's where Jacob was injured by his wrestling match with Jesus. Um, and so there are examples of, of theophanies. Uh, Abraham, Sarah, Lot, Hagar, uh, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, and Noah. That one, that, I have to look that one up. I don't know who that is. Um, and so, in the in the old, in the Old Testament, it says the angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord. Angel means messenger. It doesn't mean heavenly being. It just means messenger. Uh, so, when I'm speaking a message to you, I'm an angel. Uh, that's that's yes. That's another uh, another expression in the Old Testament. They talk about the son of. Uh, I saw one who looked like a son of man. Or uh, when um, John the Baptist was, was preaching, they said, are you the son of man? Uh, which in one context means, are you human? But in the other context, it, in another context, it means, are you the Christ? Uh, and so, yeah, son of man would be another phrase that, you know, a professor of theology would say, well, that's another theophany. Um, so that's kind of a funny word. God. Yeah, I. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, I will often make a distinction between Jesus and Christ. Uh, you know, Jesus was the human name of that ultimate theophany. Christ is his title more so than his name. Jesus who was the Christ or Jesus who is the Christ. Um, lovely song that we sing is Jesus Messiah. Or, or in the Hebrew, it's Yeshua HaMashiach, with a ch nice to it. Yes. Right. Now those those could be characterized as epiphanies, but not theophanies. Oh uh, gosh, I need to hold this to next week. I think we have to. Um, there's no way I can do justice to wisdom in two minutes. Yes. Yeah, when when you look at the at the uh, the song of Mary, my soul doth magnify the Lord. That's what she had to say in response to the visit of the angel, who told her, "You will conceive and bear a child, and you will name that child Emmanuel." And that angel is is named. Gabriel in the in the in the book, um, so that that clearly was not God incarnate or God apparent. Uh, it was a messenger who was sent from God. But when Jacob had his wrestling match, that was a physical creature. I should say, well, being. Thank you. Um, that was a, a physical being. You can't wrestle with a spirit, physically wrestle. And, and Jacob had a wrestling match. Um, I'd never hurt my hip, but I threw my shoulder out in the wrestling match, so I have a little bit of empathy for the, the pain that, that that would have involved. Um, and, and, and so that wasn't so much an angel, and we think of angels as being spiritual beings with no physical uh, body. It, it was something with a physical body. So it was a pre-incarnate. And, and then you start getting into the mysteries of God because incarnate means in body. Carne means meat. So the incarnate God is, is God in, in a meat body. And the, the, the being that wrestled with Jacob was in a body. Otherwise, it could not have wrestled with him. But is that... These are some of the things that I say. I, I want to run around and yell and scream because I get so... I was about to say damn excited. I get so blessed excited about, about this.
You're 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 starting to get, a, 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 you're starting to evidence the same excitement and 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 intellectual wonder that that I feel about this whole stuff because the messenger, my thought as you were saying that is, there's not a big difference between the the Hebrew word for message and the Hebrew word for messenger. And there are there are um, there are word plays like that all throughout the Old Testament. Um, we we sometimes laugh about how the female of our species is called womb man because it's a man with a womb. Like maybe that's ac an accidental pun, but in the Old Testament it is that way. And uh, when we talk about the first man as being some guy named Adam, Adam is the Hebrew word for man. Uh, and when you, uh, there's a, another Hebrew pun in, in play on words. It's not meant to be funny, but there's another Hebrew play on words in the, in the first chapter of, or second chapter of Genesis where talking about making woman out of the rib, the two Hebrew words are ish and isha. And, it, and it's an intentional connection between those two words. So when you look at the, the angel of the Lord, well, that word angel is the messenger of the Lord. It would not have been unprecedented unprecedented for that to be a wordplay between the message of the Lord and the messenger of the Lord. And what's another uh, term for message? Word. So the messen it's it's a it's not a long trip from the angel of the Lord, to the messenger of the Lord, to the message of the Lord, which is the word of the Lord. So this is the kind of stuff that really inflates my balloon and, and, and gets me really, really juiced up. And wisdom is is more of that, and we'll, we'll come into that. Um, but we're actually five minutes over already, so we still haven't gotten through John 1.1. 1, 1. But as soon as we get past these these terms and, and you start to get a, a sense of my excitement and my intellectual wonder, then I can sort of file that by title as we go by it all throughout John, because the the, the play between the message, messenger, word of God, that happens all throughout there. And that's at the, at the core of, for me, uh, charismatic theology. Charismatic Pentecostal theology is not just about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's far more expansive and wonderful than that. And, and that's the sort of stuff that I'm hoping to convey. The Gnostics got a piece of that, and then they went crazy. And that's how we ended up with the Gnostic heresies. Unfortunately, the Gnostic heresies have come back, and there are churches now that call themselves Pentecostal that are really Gnostic. And, and it's questionable or debatable as to whether they're really Christian anymore when they've, when they've done that, because they've changed the essence of Christ. And the essence of God. I'm sorry. Probably, not not a lot, because that's another one of those. That's a day long tangent. Um, yes, 
try I, I, I will try to make the distinction between the that heresy that comes up under the label Pentecostalism um, which I think all of us when we see it recognize that it's not right but don't, we don't know why it's most important that you know that it's not right it's not critical that you know why it's not right it, it, in the bank they don't teach tellers how to recognize counterfeit. They teach tellers how to recognize the real thing. And then when something that isn't the real thing comes by, they know it's not right. They don't know why. They just know it's wrong. And that's what we as, as theologians, as apologists for Christianity, we need to know the real thing well enough that when something comes by that's not right, we know it's not right. Don't need to know why. Just we just need to know it's wrong. But we can run away yelling and screaming, and saying, "Ah, get away from me!" Oh, Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for the patience of these people as I go incredibly wonky. And I pray that you would give me the the wisdom and the word to convey some of the the awesomeness of this mystery. Not to say that I understand it, but to, to share that peace that I have a hold of. And pray for us as we travel this evening in the snow and what might turn into ice soon. And bring us safely all back together the next time we meet. In Jesus' name.